Hello, welcome everyone to the Engineer Whisperer podcast. I'm super excited to be here today with Paul. Paul, welcome to the podcast. All right, thanks for having me. You know, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you. And today it's going to be a little bit different because I'm going to get to hear some stories and new things about your journey. So this is really a treat for me as well. So as we get started, tell us a little bit about you. Okay, so I'm I'm an engineer. I spent most of my career on things that fly in space. Um, I was an Air Force officer out of college, working on um, technology to make spacecraft hard to find and hard to kill, um, part of the original Star Wars program. And then I uh, I got a master's degree in business, but in the middle of that, I hooked up with a friend from at my 10 year high school reunion and um, we got to talking about Hubble and I'd always been in astronomy since a kid and I'd even written a paper in on the management failures that led to the Hubble optical problem. And we were talking, he goes, Hey, you know, a lot about Hubble for somebody who never worked on it. You know, if you're interested in working on the, uh, Hubble repair when you get done with, uh, you know, next spring with your master's degree, give me a call. So I ended up calling him that winter. I got an interview with the man in charge of, um, the project to go fix Hubble and upgrade Hubble. And he hired me and, uh, that's how I got into NASA. So I spent most of my career at NASA working on, on the Hubble space telescope, um, the optical correction, and then uh, upgrades to science instruments. And then I got the opportunity to work on the James Webb Space Telescope when it was just getting started and it was all ideas on paper. And um, I saw that through to its successful commissioning and start of science operations. And, um, and now I'm retired as a NASA civil servant, but I still work supporting NASA missions um, as a uh, working for a small aerospace company. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. And, um, but I, I've always been into, um, tinkering and building things. So, you know, I, my parents, I guess my parents noticed this as a young age. So when I was six years old for Christmas, they gave me a workbench and the next Christmas they gave me a, a small telescope and that just fed my curiosity and, and, uh, I've, since since I can remember, I've always wanted to tinker and build things and, um, you know, explore things. And so that's me. Well, thank you. And I wanted to invite you today to talk about this tinkering, to talk about the things that engineers do outside their work that actually influences their work and leadership greatly. So. Today, I would like to hear more about this passion of yours, of, of tinkering, of building. Um, tell us more. So I, I, I've always been, and I don't think this is unusual, but among engineers, I um, you know, I always want to know how things work and enjoyed building things. And um, uh, yeah, so like I, built my radio shack, which doesn't exist anymore. You know, I got my first little kit that you could build a little AM radio and I built that from the kit and then couldn't, couldn't leave well enough alone. I wanted to package it into a, uh, a cigar tube. So, <laughs> so I packaged it into a cigar tube and then I remember bringing it to school. I was in first or second grade and bringing it to school and at recess, you know, taking it outside and finding where I could get a good antenna surrogate to uh, connect to so I could, you know, see if I could improve its reception performance. And so that's, you know, that's just, that was the start. <laughs> um, Maybe what was something that you tinkered with that didn't work, you couldn't figure out and how did that make oh, you feel? The, most of the time there were things I didn't understand. So, and uh, I just wanted to understand the fundamentals, uh, the basics of how something would work. Um, I, I don't know if this influenced me or not, but I remember when one of my earliest memories is being, I'm pretty sure I was four years old 
And, you know, this is back when TVs were all tubes, you know, not just the cathode ray tube, but the guts, the electronics inside were vacuum tubes. And back in that day, this is in the six, mid sixties, you know, people would, uh, you had the tube man come to your house and he'd, he'd fix your TV. Like if you're, your vertical hold, hold is all messed up. Some of these terms are going to mean nothing to a lot of people because, uh, this goes way back, but, <laughs> um, you know, there were all these knobs. You could adjust a TV picture with your, uh, on an old TV. And, um, a lot of times it was a bad vacuum tube or something. And so one, you know, there were, there were, the tube man would come to your house, take your television, the back off your television set, test some tubes, put them back in, and then your TV works. And uh, I thought that was cool. So um, I just always wanted to know how things worked, you know, and understand why they worked that way. And and uh, and most of the time I didn't understand when I started on something, I didn't understand how it worked, but I really wanted to know, well, how and why, you know, and, which I think is a common thing among engineers and people who become scientists too. So, um, so Paul, but, walk me through the mindset. What, again, what is the difference between one who wants to understand the what, the how mm -hmm. and the why, and one who wants to understand the what, the how and the why, but gives up. So oh. what, what kept you keep going even after you didn't understand and you took something yeah. apart and you still didn't understand something? Mm -hmm. I mean, good question. I, I, uh, I just, you know, there's, there, there's a reason for things, you know, physics is a thing. It's like, I, I, I just need to know, <laughs> I need to know why something works. It's just not satisfying to go, Oh, well, that black box does this. It's like, no, no. Why, how does uh -huh. that thing work? I mean, it's, it should be understandable. If, um, so how did you find the information? How did, you know, I mean, for, as, a, as a child, how did you build yourself up for success? How did you find the information? Um, oh, well, I did like to read the encyclopedia. So my parents, you know, this is back way before the internet and anything. So if you wanted to, you had to read a book to figure anything out. Yes. And, um, you know, so you go to the library or you had what you had at home. And, you know, this is back when you know, the encyclopedia salesman would come to your door and he'd be like, Hey, you want to buy a set of encyclopedias, you know, Oh, we'll gift you a yearbook every year. It has all the updates to the information because information changes. And, and I just enjoyed like randomly pulling out a uh, encyclopedia. And I guess it's equivalent to like a wiki, a, a Wikipedia uh, thread now where it's like, oh, you read something and it's on a Wikipedia page or something. And then you see links in that page to something else. And you're like, oh, I want to, I need to learn about that. So I would just read the, I would read stuff in the encyclopedia. Maybe it started off as a school assignment about, you know, the history of South Africa or something, something just random. And then, and then, that would take me down these threads and I just go read more stuff. So I just liked reading random things in the encyclopedia, just on all sorts of topics. Uh, and also another thing my parents bought me, I mean, obviously they really nurtured, nurtured me. They saw this interest and they just fed it. So yes. I, uh, uh, I remember getting the, this two volume book in two volumes called the, what the, the way things work. Wow. And it was just all sorts of, mechanical and electrical and thermal things, you know, machines and like how they worked. And I would just dive into that. And I'm like, yeah, I still wouldn't get it on the first try, but maybe after the fifth try, I'm mean, like, I, okay, I'm starting to understand. I just, I, I wasn't, I guess the thing that drove me to answer your question is I wasn't satisfied just accepting something as, you know, well, that's how it works. You know, it just is. That doesn't work for me. I need to understand the how and the why um, uh, to be satisfied. So, and a really strong commitment to to finding out. It's because most of us push through the fears and the the failures. Um, I mean, sorry, the other way. Most of us don't push through the fears and mm. the failures. And and don't like to to go and dig deeper and you know involve others and so forth. So you were 
almost like building your your skills and leadership at a very young age to then build the basics, your foundations of how you're going to then be in the world. And then, as, as you mentioned, then you were invited to, to a job because of these foundations that you have built. Um, now, earlier before the podcast, you mentioned something about your car. Tell us that story. Yes. Yes. So, so I, uh, I have a little Triumph Spitfire. I've had it for, I guess, exactly 30, uh, just over like 30 and a half years now. I bought it out of a classified ad in the newspaper and um, it was pretty much a piece of junk when I bought it, but it was relatively rust free. So that was good for <laughs> body work, body work purposes and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, the engine was ready to, to literally blow up. It was in the process of throwing a connecting rod, but that was fine because that gave me the excuse to um, rebuild an engine. So, but uh, yeah, I got this car when I was already what, 32, so 31 years old. I had already, I had already built one car, rebuilt one car and kind of partially rebuilt another one before this, but this one was, I still have, and it was just a lot of fun. I learned my well, engineering degrees in electrical engineering. And so I'd had basic mechanical engineering classes and thermal, but um, there's something about working on this car or like working on anything hands-on that you learn a lot of practical knowledge and it helps connect the dots too for any of your academic background. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've learned it really solidified and helped me in so many ways at work, especially when it came to say mechanical engineering because I pretty much redid the suspension on this thing and tuned it um, to the way I wanted it. And I just learned a lot of things that really solidified what you learn in a book that in, in a way that you don't, you don't get till you actually are hands on and say, practice it. And, and, and of course it, 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 um, it, it was valuable in that, um, you know, it makes you think more about if you're designing or like specifying requirements or designing something, it makes you think more about, well, somebody has to build this, test it, use it. And so that's having that hands on makes you, makes you better at, at designing or specifying or designing and certainly gives you an appreciation for like you know, a lot of engineers don't do the hands-on work. They maybe do the requirements or the design, but it's technicians that build things yeah. and have to repair things. And so it makes, gives you an appreciation for what they do. And, um, and you can build a rapport with, with the people that actually are doing the touch labor for stuff, for things that maybe you are responsible for or specify or whatever. And I just think that's really valuable. I, I guess you can get that from co-ops and other things that you can do when you're in school. But um, uh, yeah, having the car as a hobby and having to work through all kinds of mechanical, electrical, thermal problems and build the thing myself just was, was really valuable um, at my job at NASA. So, yeah. Yeah, what I'm hearing is really this almost like a safe test environment. The car was to to think about design differently and then prototype it, uh, sure. fail fail at it. And yes, then... <laughs> you could fail safely because okay. So if a weld goes on something structural, yeah, it, it's life threatening. But you can you can screw things up without fear because in the space business especially yeah. scientific instruments, you, you really are building a one of a kind thing. There's a lot of value added. There's a lot of process to make sure that, um, you don't screw it up. You don't lose all that added value that gets added as the thing progresses to yeah. the point where it's, you can launch it into space. Hey, working on an old British car, you know, you can, you can screw something up and learn, learn that way. Um, I mean, 
the, the best example of that, like in actually in space business today is what SpaceX does, right? They, they're, when they develop new rockets, they're a lot, they, they have kind of more of an old school approach where it's like, all right, we're going to, we're not going to depend solely on computer models and analysis. We're going to get to a certain point, build the hardware, try it out, learn from those, learn from where it doesn't perform. And then they take that information and turn it, feed it right back into the next iteration of stuff. And that's a really great way to, um, if you're able to do that, to um, learn. So on for launch vehicles, you can do that for uh, a one of a kind science instrument for the Hubble Space Telescope or for the James Webb Space Telescope itself. You're lucky if we have, we were, we were careful about deciding what things we would build engineering models of yes. and test units of, but ultimately the flight model is one thing and, and, and it had to work. And yeah, so with the British car, you can, you can screw up more rapidly, more easily, learn more quickly, turn it around. And, um, yeah, and a lot of practical skills I learned from that, that applied, that applied when we were having, um, when we were developing the James Webb space telescope. What I'm also hearing Paul, that what the, the car helped you develop is, is a mindset of, of trying, failing, screwing up, starting over, and at the same time, thinking about the big picture of how things are, are working together. And also what I'm hearing is this humble, hmm, this, this skill to be, to stay humble, that what I'm designing is, it's just part of the big picture. It's just part of what the end result's gonna be. So as you said, they are the, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm in charge of this piece and then there are those people who, who make it, who build it and, and oper operationalize it. So I am, um, so I just love your mindset as of, I can be easily connected still to those people who then, take what I designed, what I'm in charge of, and then they do something with it. So it's the the adding additional value to to your work. And I, I love that leadership. It's 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 that inclusiveness and understanding that even though I am we're all working on the same thing. We all are accountable for different parts of it. But together we are accountable for the whole thing so success yeah. actually re relies on on us connecting building a relationship and then supporting each other yes yes absolutely <laughs> <laughs> now i know something else about you what you are passionate about is you like to go and climb a mountain so how is how is the climbing mountains connected with the tinkering and building? And then how did you transition all those skills into leadership? Um, so I guess, yeah, I like, look, I'm no Sir Edmund Hillary or anything. So, <laughs> but I like to hike up um, mountains. I just always have, um, I, I guess it's, it's a goal thing. Um, you know, I want, I'm like when a buddy and I, who was one of our lead engineers on James Webb say skulls telescope, we, we decided, Hey, let's go climb Mount Whitney. And we planned our trip and we hiked up and down in one day. And, um, it's like 11 miles up, 11 miles back. And it was great. It's just, Hey, this is the highest mountain in, in the lower 48. And I just want to get to the top of it. And the view is going to be awesome. And, uh, yeah, I just like to, I guess I like to explore. I like to have that feeling of accomplishment. Um, um, uh, so what different yeah. challenges did that it's pose a, for you? I, um, I mean, it's not a technical climb, it's a hike, but you know, the air gets thinner at 14 and a half thousand feet. So <laughs> um, That's true. it's just, uh, yeah, I, I, I just 
yeah, I don't know, because it's there. I wanted to, <laughs> I want to do it. I just like climbing to the top of uh, ridges or peaks and seeing the view. I don't know. It's a sense of accomplishment. And, um, um, you know, you set a goal, you go do it. Um, you think about what you need to do it. You know, you think about contingencies, think about, yeah. you know, margin for time, margin for this, margin for that. There's a lot of parallels with engineering, right? Where, yes. Um, and, uh, and then the execute and then, you know, it's like, Oh, cool. I achieved something. So, uh, um, so what was it like walking down? What was it like, you know, Oh, walking I mean, down for you, what your spirit, your attitude, your mood. Yeah. It's great. Cause you're like, yeah, yeah, cool. We, you know, did it. It's not like a disappointment. Like, Oh, okay. Well I reached my goal. Now what? It's like, no, no. I mean, it's cool coming back down too. So, um, I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the journey. You have to get back to your starting point. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I've always liked it. When I was younger, I don't think it's, it's received. It's probably not something I'm going to achieve. Let's be honest. It's not something I'm going to achieve. Uh, but I, when I was 20, 30 years ago, I thought, Oh, I want to do the seven. I want to do the seven peaks, right? The seven tallest peaks on the seven continents. And, um, I guess if I had really put my mind to it, maybe I could have done it, but, but I would have had to sacrifice something, right? I, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did at work on the Hubble Space Telescope or James Webb Space Telescope, or I would have had to have given up on having, having a wonderful, you know, family, you know, something would have had to give because there's only so many hours in the day and, you know, but, but I, I used to dream about, oh, yeah, I want to climb, uh, you know, Aconcagua in South America, Kilimanjaro. You know, that's a hike. It's not a technical climb. It's just it's just you're above half the atmosphere. So it's it, it's um you got to acclimate um, climb. Uh, you know, oh, I forget the name of the mountain that's like in um, on Borneo. This kind of the, I think it's the tallest mountain in Oceania or um, and then. You know, of course, there's Everest, right? And uh, I guess in Europe, it's it's um, I don't know if it's Mont Blanc or what. I forget what the seven are, but you know, there's there's McKinley, Aconcagua, and and um, um, Kilimanjaro, and then the one in Antarctica. I'm getting old, so I'm losing my memory for names. But you know, there's the seven tallest peaks on the seven continents, and like trying to climb each one. The one yeah. in Australia, I forget what that's called, but that one's maybe the lowest ones, not the necessarily the hardest. So, but it would just be cool to do that, you know, go around the world, climb the tallest ones. Um, uh, most of them are, or a good chunk of them aren't, aren't um, technical climbs necessarily. You go at the right time of year and you, you condition yourself right for the altitude and you're in good shape, you can do it. Um, it's a thing, right? They're among, I guess, people that like to climb. And like I said, I'm not, I'm not a technical climber. So, um, but it would, that was a goal I always thought that would be cool. And, and now I'm 62. It's, you know, it would take, it's not, let's face it, it's not going to happen. But I always thought that'd be cool, you know. <laughs> so at least climbing Mount Whitney or, or um, you know, I still think I could, I'd still love to hike up Kilimanjaro one day. I know that's doable. Um, there you go. It just takes, just takes several days and you got to acclimate. And then, you know, Aconcagua and the Andes would be, would be really cool. Um, so maybe I could do some of them and not like really kill myself. The one in Europe and Australia should be well, a big deal. Yeah. It's just hard to get, it's hard to get to Australia. So, <laughs> and then Everest is overdone, right? It's that, that that's like become the a check mark for the uber wealthy. And it's like, and it's littered with oxygen bottles and it's, that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> what I'm hearing is that the dream is is turning into something, you know, it's morphing, it's transitioning into a, a new dream, a yeah. different dream. And that's okay. And I think that is part of why I love talking with you that starting young and having a passion and interest for something. And then as you said, fueled by and nurtured by your parents. Um just kept you going and going and that is something that inspired me since i've known you that it's it's not hmm, how to say it it's uh 
it's about this mindset that you keep going, you keep figuring out, you, you keep asking questions, you keep getting to, to the answers or the answer. Um, and it's for me very similar to keep climbing a mountain. There are all these details. You can say that um, you, you won't do it, but then you do it, you figure it, figure out a way. And, and that part of pulling people with you and going along with others, as you said, with your friend. Uh, yeah, that has been very inspirational for me. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so as we're getting close to the end, Paul, um, over all these years, you had an opportunity to work on cool things and be part of cool projects. What was one one memory that really stuck with you as of where it um, it was about the the human side, the the oh. inspiring others to like you keep going to find the answers to 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 follow their their heart um i mean i've been really fortunate to work on very cool things so uh every, it's it's the team achievement because none of these things are, are done by one person it's like you said earlier you know it's it really is a team effort so um i've been really fortunate to work in on projects where like all the people are wicked smart and um you know super curious uh like i am and we're just we're we're all you know we all have that common common ground of, of this cool thing we're trying to build and, um, the, the amazing science it's going to do. And so in a sense, I guess it's easy cause we're all, we all have that in common and, um, you know, it's not that, that part, that part's already established. So then getting everybody, uh, rowing in the same direction is that much easier, honestly, yeah. even though it's a hard thing to do. Um, and, you know, with the first time one of a kind engineering thing, there's always some existential crisis. It seems like all the time. Um, but yeah, you're able to, you're able to solve them with just, you know, working together and, um, just putting your mind to it, you know, but yeah, I, I the cool thing is just all the, the, the team, uh, achieve the team accomplishment. It's like. I remember when the, we saw a couple of moments, it's hard to say one in particular, but you know, one is like when, when we got the, the first images down from the Hubble Space Telescope after, through the different instruments when, um, after the repair mission, and it was obvious that we, we had basically fixed the optical flaw and that, that's, that's an amazing feeling. I remember being at a press conference here at NASA Goddard and Senator Barbara Mikulski you know, held up a picture of a before and after um, image through the faint object camera and a first generation instrument on Hubble that 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 the correction I worked on corrected. And uh, she's like, the trouble with Hubble is over. And it's like obvious to a non optical engineer even that, yeah, that's messed up. And this one's fixed. And um, and it was just, that's a cool feeling. And then, you know, web, like when we first saw, geez, there were so many moments, but you know, launch was a huge celebration. Everybody was just like, this is awesome, you know? And, um, <laughs> but then a whole nother bunch of work starts immediately when the, all the deployments were done, uh, you know, um, 295 out of 330. 344 single point failures successfully passed that were all associated with deployment. You know, this thing got all fully deployed. That was a huge relief because now our 
we'd just gotten through most of the riskiest part of the whole mission. And, and then the next thing was when we first got first light through the telescope and, uh, we knew, even though we saw 18 different images of the same star, that's what we expected because we hadn't aligned the mirrors yet. And, but we saw what we were supposed to see and we're like, man, we, we nailed this thing and then getting it working. And, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing this before the public ever sees it. And we're like, oh, this thing's going to be, going to be great. It's going to, it's going to work beautifully. And, um, yeah. And then, and then see all that happen. And you're there with all these people you've worked with for 20 plus years. Right. And, and you've, you, you did this together and, yeah. and, uh, it works this incredibly complicated device that humans built designed to build works. And yeah, it's just pretty cool. It's hard to, um, it's hard to explain how cool that is Yes. and, um, how rewarding that is. And, uh, it's cool. So. Yeah. It's yeah. that feeling, right. It's really hard to explain the feeling yeah. of being in a room where everybody is, uh, just like me right now, just the big sigh and almost like you want to hug everyone. It's just the emotions yeah, yeah. are <laughs> maybe even the people that you didn't want to hug before. But it's, yeah. it's, it, it, it gets <laughs> to that point where, yeah, it's beyond what we imagined and what we have felt before. And then collectively feeling it, it just elevates it to a level, as you said, um, I think the inspiration for all of us who are are listening to you, Paul, is to to keep being curious, as you said, super curious. Keep finding that room, large room, <laughs> of people who are super curious with you, and then who are willing to commit to create something that maybe never been created, not yeah. yet, and then to keep committing to the journey because as you said there are years of of working together of, of pushing through problems and issues and challenges and then having the mindset of of still of a beginner that there's a lot to learn and my piece is a piece of the whole and then to respect others who have the other pieces of the whole and then um i mean i love the part where if I move up, pull somebody up with me so that we elevate everyone at the same time. And yeah, so those places, those rooms exist. And thank you for sharing. I hope that inspires a lot of young engineers to, to keep tinkering, building, creating, asking questions, finding out why things work and how they work. And then at the same time, finding people like you who will nurture and fuel their, their curiosity uh, with, you know, with whatever in books and <laughs> encyclopedias we have and we can give them right now. So whatever that fuel is for people, let's give it to them and allow them to, to explore and then thrive. So as we're closing, Paul, I would like to give the mic back to you. Close us out with with something that you want us to leave with today. Oh, well, I guess two things. One, um, you know, whenever whenever uh, we build a new tool of science with, you know, unprecedented capabilities uh and then use it to examine nature we always discover amazing things and that's 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 just the cool thing about working in in um engineering things for you know science for uh exploratory science it's cool so web's proof of that right um we built this tool to with unprecedented capabilities to, to observe things that have never been observed. And it's, it's humbling. It's great. Cause it's like, Oh, some our models of how the universe works 
probably aren't right. Something's missing. Yeah. And you just want to, you know, for every question you answer, there's two new ones to uh, ask. And then I guess the second thing is, I think things like Hubble Repair and Web are proof that, you know, a group of people, if they're united in purpose, um, it's amazing what humans can do when we put our minds to it. The, the Apollo program was a really good example too, right? That's got to be one of our species crowning achievements was landing people on another celestial body and returning them home. You know, how cool is that? Uh, and this was back, you know, in 1969 for crying out loud. Uh, so um, it just goes to show, you know, people united for something positive can, can do, you know, humans can do amazing things um, in a positive way, um, which is cool. So it, it's good to know, you know, given all the things that humans are, can be really awful about <laughs> that we can do really cool things. So, uh, yeah. Yes. I love that reminder, Paul, that we humans can do some really cool things together, united, same purpose. So no, it's, um, we do, we do need these reminders, Paul. Yes. I think these are important because, um, there are many changes in, in our world, in our society around us, and we forget. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much for sharing. And let me ask you the last question. If people want to reach out and ask you more questions because you got them curious, how can they do that? Oh, um, I guess they can email me. <laughs> um should I give out my email? <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I have a LinkedIn page. Uh, people can look me up there and there reach out to me that way. I mean, maybe that's the best way. But yeah, I'm happy to um, happy to aid the the similarly curious out there. Awesome, awesome. Well, on that note, thank you very much for being here. Uh, it was a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Thank you.